Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk of London's most notorious and often forgotten murder cases, all set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is a guided walk of the little known death of Jane Farvish, a humble Soho resident with a simple problem to solve. And yet her agonizing, lingering, and painful death is not the most shocking element of this case. And although this isn't a murder as such, the actions of the man who killed her and the outcome of the story is certain to make your blood boil. Murder Mile contains vivid descriptions which may not be suitable for those of a sensitive disposition, as well as photos, videos, and maps which accompany this series, so that no matter where you listen to this podcast, you feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 6, The Deadliest Dentist in Soho. Today, I'm standing on Broadwick Street, W1, a heavily renovated part of Soho that is unrecognisable from the grotty, crumbling, tumble-down slum that it once was. A place where no one would choose to live unless their life took an unfortunate turn for the worse. And yet, hints of its former self still exist as much of this partly pedestrianised street is covered in cobbles, speckled with grade two listed buildings and dotted with the occasional Victorian streetlight or bollard, but the rest is all new, bright and shiny. Looking supremely clean, neatly sculpted and painfully cosmopolitan, although barely the length of a football field, Broadwick Street today consists of two one-way streets which converge in the middle and confuse the hell out of every motorist who has stupidly turned off Wardour Street to the east and is either stuck in a rabbit's warren of impossibly tight side streets or has come a cropper at Carnaby Street to the west, which only a local would know is a dead end. Being a very modern part of the metropolis, the pace of life on Broadwick Street is slow. Here you can sup a posh coffee in the Nespresso Café, sample a feta and red pepper pitta in London's first vegetarian Pret-a-Manger, hobnob with the celebs at the exclusive Ivy restaurant, slink off for a snooze in a teeny tiny boutique apartment, as well as queuing up for an hour to be suspiciously glared at by a steroid fueled security guard in a super snotty shoe shop, which has literally 10 pairs of shoes for sale. Here, everything is calm, sedate and serene. Which, strangely, is exactly how Jane Farvish was. After her swollen and bloody face had stopped twitching. On the corner of Broadwick Street, situated at numbers 15 to 17, sits a five-star rated contemporary Chinese restaurant called Yaoicha which specialises in dim sum, cocktails and handmade sweets. But its brightly coloured, pristine clean and supremely stylish glass-fronted facade is a far cry from the hideous hovel it once was. And so difficult was this location to find. It's almost as if someone has deliberately and repeatedly attempted to erase it from history. In the early 1900s, on this site stood a three-storey dilapidated townhouse from the early 1700s. It was in such a sorry state of disrepair that the house and most of this street was entirely demolished, rebuilt, renamed and renumbered in the 1930s and then decimated by two Nazi bombs in the 1940s and rebuilt again in the 2000s. With the latest phase of rebuilding continuing right up until today. But by 1908, in the final year of Jane Farvish's life, this building was numbered 54A Broad Street. 
Broad Street was a festering pocket of urban decay, where much of the city's poorest were crammed into the crumbling remains of the slum housing. Daylight was obscured by the belching fumes from the Lion Brewery. The stench of open cesspits, full of human feces, stung their nostrils. An infected water pump, which, just 50 years earlier, had caused a cholera outbreak so severe that one-sixth of Soho's population had died. And under their feet stood a plague pit, 500 feet wide, 600 feet long, and packed with rotting corpses, ten bodies deep, all of whom had died of the dreaded Black Death. It's safe to say that, unless they really had to, Broad Street was a place where no one wanted to work and no one wanted to live. And although he wasn't a resident of Soho, having wisely decided to live in the more affluent Shepherd's Bush, roughly four and a half miles to the west, by 1908, the ground floor of 54A Broad Street was a simple two-room premises, which went by the name of Soho Drug Stores. A chemist's and a dentist's shop with a wooden sign on the door which simply read, Teeth Extracted. It was owned by Isidore Ziefert. Born in Moscow in 1875, Isidore Ziefert was a five foot four inch Russian Jew of slender build, who, although he came from a relatively privileged background, and was blessed with a higher than average intelligence and a burning desire to succeed, he would always struggle to achieve his goals that he felt he deserved, owing to an air of arrogance which surrounded him. Having supposedly studied medicine in Vilnia, which is now Vilnius in the former Russian Republic of Lithuania for seven years, all prior to his 22nd birthday, Ziford was forced to flee during the pogrom in the late 1800s, when thousands of Russian Jews were persecuted, hunted and murdered for their religious and political beliefs. With very few provable qualifications, Ziford enrolled 300 miles away at the Red Cross Hospital in Warsaw, in the former Russian Republic of Poland, where he undertook what he would describe as a special course of medicine and surgery prior to studying for a bachelor's degree in medicine. Sadly, having spent five years at Warsaw University, prior to his final examination, Ziefert was arrested on an unspecified charge for what he would later refer as political reasons. And yet again, Ziefert was forced to flee, this time leaving his home country behind forever. By 1902, 27-year-old Isidore Ziefert had arrived in London, over 1,000 miles from the border of his native Russia, with very few belongings, very little money, and almost no medical credentials. So being unqualified, partially trained, and woefully inexperienced, the best employment that Ziefert could get was by assisting a variety of medical practitioners in a strictly junior capacity including Dr. Glixman for just over one year, Dr. Harvey for almost three years, and another unspecified doctor for two years, where he helped administer a variety of powerful anaesthetics to their patients, before setting up his own chemist's and dentist shop at 54A Broad Street. And yet, during his trial, when questioned about his woeful lack of qualifications and experience, Isidore Ziefert, the 33-year-old, slightly cocky, but equally nervous prisoner, who had no medical degree, no chemist license, and who was not and would never be registered as a practicing oral surgeon, would later state in court, For about 13 years, I have been in constant practice as a dentist. Today, dentists are heavily regulated, routinely tested and highly qualified. But up until 1879, Britain had no compulsory registration nor qualification for dentists, meaning anyone 
whether a doctor, a teacher, a butcher, or even a barber, could set up shop as a dentist. Thankfully, with the British Parliament passing the first Dentist Act in 1878 and establishing a dental register in 1879, it was decreed that only qualified professionals who could prove that they had practiced dentistry for the past five years were eligible to register. But somehow, Isidore Ziefert slipped through the net. By 1908, Soho Drug Stores at 54A Broad Street had been open for less than a year, and yet business was busy, as the poor condition of the average person's teeth had began to take its toll. Most households had just one toothbrush per family, made from soft feathered twigs, which they all shared, but many families had none. And so, as the average person's diet got sweeter, combined with a severe lack of fresh fruit to eat and clean water to drink, many of the poorest people, by their early 20s, didn't have a set of teeth so much as they had a misshapen collection of swollen painful stumps, brown jutting shards, and infected rotten holes. Although Broad Street was a filthy rancid slum, by situating himself in the dead centre of Soho, Isidore Ziefert had truly found a niche for himself. As with many Russian Jews who'd escaped the horrors of the pogroms having settled in this area, and being rightfully fearful of outsiders, Ziefert was one of the few Russian Jewish dentists in this tightly knit community. And although he was inexperienced and unqualified, he was cheap, trusted, local, and best of all, he was one of their own. For three painful days and three sleepless nights, 41-year-old Jane Farvish of Church Street, Soho, a woman who would be unflatteringly described as being of generous proportions, had been suffering with chronic toothache, which had left her tired and weak, so much so that her constant moaning, groaning and writhing in agony had meant that her husband Nathan and their daughter Annie were unable to sleep in the tiny one-roomed lodging that they shared. Like most people, Jane Farvish had never visited a dentist in her life, and nor did she plan to do so, as although her toothy yellowy stumps and red swollen gums were excruciatingly painful, a trip to the dentist was a notoriously unpleasant experience, especially if you were poor. As not only were many dentists unskilled, untrained and often unqualified, the instruments they had to work with were crude metal tools like the infamous extractor. A barbaric primitive stick with a sharp metal claw at the end, which, like a set of pliers, would wrench, twist and pull the rotten tooth out of its swollen hole as blood poured down the patient's face. Of course, you could always pay for an anaesthetic to dull the pain, such as gas, chloroform and nitrous oxide but only if you could afford to. Whereas if you were poor, you had to be held down and hoped that you passed out before the pain got too bad. Luckily for Jane Farvish, Nathan, her husband, had asked around and her closest friends in this tight-knit Jewish community had recommended a local dentist situated just a few streets away and had reassured her that Isidore Ziefert he is a good man, a good dentist. He is one of us, you can trust him. And with that, Nathan, Annie and Jane made that fateful six-minute walk. The icy wind blasted their frozen faces as they trudged through the knee-deep snow along Old Compton Street and turned right into Wardour Street. But it wasn't the blistering wind which slowed Jane's pace to a crawl, as being too tired to eat and too weak to sleep, owing to her chronic toothache, Jane was also riddled with rheumatism, racked with headaches, as her lungs wheezed 
her heart palpitated, and her exhausted organs struggled to cope under the enormous pressure of her plump round body. Meaning three times on that short journey, they had to stop so Jane could rest. On Saturday the 18th of January 1908, at 3.20pm, all three members of the Farvish family entered Soho drugstores at 54A Broad Street, which consisted of two wood-lined rooms, a chemist shop up front featuring a rear wall full of small wooden drawers and a long wide counter complete with a till, pills, a pestle and mortar and vials of potions, lotions and poisons. And behind the shop was the dentist's surgery, which was staffed by Isidore Zephyrt. Being barely able to speak through her tiredness and pain, Jane Farvish let her daughter Annie do most of the talking. My mother is weak. She is suffering from rheumatism. She has been up all night suffering from the toothache, she said, as her weak, wheezing mother was led into the surgery and slowly sat in his hideously cheap dentist chair, which was made from an odd mix of wood and wicker. As Jane lay back, her weight supported by the chair, her aching limbs no longer struggling, and her frozen toes slowly soothed by the roaring log fire. Zephyr opened his patient's mouth, and instantly he was hit by the smell of rotten meat from the two impacted yellow stumps, which once upon a time had been a tooth. I'll need to remove those two stumps, Zephyr huffed. Something clearly on his mind as his eyes switched from his patient to his clock. Although even today, no one quite knows why. As she lay there, the pain causing her head to pound, her face to throb, and her heart to erratically pump. Seeing his wife's agony grow, and her body weaken, her husband Nathan requested that she be given an anaesthetic, so those two infected stumps could be removed without pain, and asked the dentist for gas, a cheap and common painkiller which, although effective, often cause temporary oxygen starvation of the brain, which, although not fatal, if done correctly, would result in the patient suffering from sickness and headaches for weeks. But then again, Zephyr was out of gas. And so, although very poor, but not wanting Jane to suffer any more, Nathan, her loyal and devoted husband, stumped up half a crown for the best anaesthetic that his modest income could afford. That painkiller of choice was cocaine. Before it became a favorite recreational drug for the middle classes in the 1980s, cocaine had been in medical use in England since 1884, and although it was still in use in 1908, by then it was listed under the 1905 UK Poisons Act which meant it could only be prescribed by a licensed chemist. And although it worked fantastically fast as a painkiller, which left you with a wonderful feeling of euphoria, cocaine has a few small side effects, such as sweating, fever, high blood pressure, and an erratic heart rate, which for an average healthy person wouldn't be too problematic, but for a person of generous proportions, like Jane Farvish, who was already at an increased risk of stroke, lung disease, and heart attacks. Cocaine could be deadly. Sadly, Soho drugstores no longer had a licensed chemist, let alone a qualified dentist, as just two months earlier, Dr. Sellers had left following a heated argument with Isidore Zephyr over unpaid wages and a matter of medical ethics. And so, with his patient in pain, her face sweating, her chest wheezing, and her heart pounding, Zephyr popped into the shop to prepare the painkiller. From one of the small wooden drawers, Zephyr pulled out a small glass syringe, a pipette of water, and a small brown bottle marked with the words poison, which legally cocaine was and prepared a solution of 10 drops of water and half a grain, roughly 90 milligrams of cocaine. 
with her husband holding her head back. The syringe's needle poked into her red swollen gums, causing her to wince. But within seconds, the pain had gone. A sense of calm descended over the dentist's surgery, as for the first time in three days, a small smile crept over Jane's face, as she slowly relaxed and her moaning ceased. But moments later, she began to sweat, her pulse was heavy, and her breathing was erratic. Naturally, Nathan was concerned, as was Annie, but Zeef had reassured them that this was simply a side effect of the cocaine and began preparing his tools to extract her rotten tooth. The last words that Jane would ever utter as she stared into a mirror at her strangely distorted face was, Look what he makes my face like. It is all crooked, she said, her speech barely audible and slurred. Yet again, Zeef had reassured them both how perfectly normal this was, and replied, When the tooth is out, it will be all right again, and proceeded to painlessly wrench, twist and pull the first of the rotten yellowy stumps free with the metal claw of his trusty extractor. But as Zeef had started to twist the second stump free, Jane's mouth began to billow with a mix of red blood and white froth. Suddenly, her muscles tensed, her back arched, her eyes rolled, and her whole body began to violently convulse. It shook so fiercely, she almost snapped the leg of the wooden chair she was sitting in. Until eventually, drenched in sweat and physically exhausted, she passed out. With no faith in his ability, Annie dashed into the street to find a doctor as Jane was laid on the couch, her swollen face contorted, and her lips bubbling with a reddening froth as a constant trickle of blood poured from the open wound in her gums onto the cold stone floor. Under her nose, Isidore Zeefert pointlessly waved a small bottle of smelling salts, his nervous hands shaking, his voice quivering. And yet again, he protested his innocence and reassured Nathan how normal this all was and said, Don't be afraid. Your wife will be like this for uh, about ten minutes. N no more. But after three quarters of an hour, Jane was silent, she was still, and she was cold to the touch. Forty-one-year-old Jane Farvish was officially pronounced dead at 6.40 p.m. At 8 p.m., Isidore Zeefert was taken to the Marlborough Street Police Station and charged with unlawful manslaughter, to which he replied, I only administered half a grain. It was in ten drops of water. I have done it hundreds of times. No harm has ever resulted. Till now... Dr. Ludwig Freiberger conducted a post-mortem on the deceased and stated that her heart was small, fatty, pliable between the fingers and the mitral valve was thickened and that the cause of death was failure of the heart and respiration. Given her size and age, a cursory examination of the heart would easily have indicated that she had a diseased mitral valve as when it is listened to using a stethoscope the valve makes a very distinctive sound. And with a fifth or a sixth of a grain of cocaine being a more than sufficient dose as an anaesthetic, not half a grain, a Zephyr had administered. The pathologist concluded that, in my opinion, her death was caused by cocaine poisoning. Following his pre-trial at Westminster Coroner's Court, he was tried at the Old Bailey on the 3rd of March, 1908. And even though Isidore Zeefert pleaded not guilty, he called no witnesses to his defense. And after a short deliberation, the jury concluded that not only had Isidore Zeefert injected his patient 
with more than double the safe dosage of cocaine, but also having only checked the gums of this 41-year-old woman of generous proportions, who'd arrived into his shop too weak to stand, too tired to stay awake, and too breathless to walk unaided. He had failed to check the state of her heart, which was standard practice when administering such a dangerous poison. When the jury returned their verdict to the unlawful murder of Jane Farvish, Isidore Ziefert, the untrained, unqualified, and woefully inexperienced dentist and chemist, was found not guilty. And even though the jury confirmed that he was guilty of reckless and criminal negligence, Ziefert was discharged without hesitation and allowed to walk free. The judge recommended that in future, when administering cocaine, that he be more careful. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. This series is available on almost all podcast platforms, so please do check us out and don't forget to click subscribe so the very latest episodes will be downloaded to your device as you sleep. How amazing is that? If you enjoyed this episode, please do rate us and like and share us with your friends. And if you fancy some exercise, why not treat yourself to Murder Mile Walk? It's my guided walk of Soho's most infamous murder cases, featuring 12 murderers across 15 locations, totaling almost 50 mysterious deaths in just one mile. Tickets are available via my website, murdermiletours.com. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the music written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Next week's episode is the identical murder at the old curiosity shop. Thank you for listening and sleep well.